Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Cadence with Frank Farrow. We're going to talk today about HBM4. Frank, we've seen a whole succession of HBM come out, high bandwidth memory. Where are we now? What's going on with HBM4 and what's different? Right. Well, we're very excited. HBM4 was announced as a standard by JEDEC uh, this past April. And what HBM does is it continues to push the bandwidth of the memory forward. The insatiable desire for, for bandwidth from hyperscalers is just uh, pushing the whole industry forward. So HBM4, what it, it basically does is takes the concept of HBM3, which is going very wide, having a very wide data uh, width, and just continuing that concept where it takes now the current HBM, which is at 1,024 bits, and doubles that uh, data to 2048 bits. So again, just pushing that very wide and slow concept was HBM to try to manage power. But now uh, slow is kind of a relative thing now, so we'll talk more about that. Let's, let's take a closer look. Sure. Frank, what are we looking at? Okay, so the, the drawing on the uh, you see here is a, uh, an example of an HBM system that's for, built for AI uh, training. And so that you can see here you have a, a system on a chip. You have, in this case, we're using six HBM DRAM stacks, and these are all sitting on a substrate. And so this is something very typical. We, we see HBM systems, any combination, you can have one or two or even up to eight, and in some cases, HBM stacks. And what these are, are trying to do uh, uh, is specific to AI training where you need a, a ton of memory bandwidth. And so what specifically changed between HBM3 and 4? So HBM3, uh, as I mentioned earlier, has the concept of going very wide data, uh, data width. And so uh, HBM3 was 1,024 bits, and now we've doubled that to 2048 bits. In addition, they've, uh, the uh, JEDEX moved the speed HBM officially was around uh, three was around six point four gig, and and they moved the speed for HBM four to eight. Gigabit. Is that enough? Right now, it's never enough. So these AI training models are growing exponentially. So we've seen uh, large language models going increasing uh, four hundred times in terms of their training parameters over like two year period. Uh, if you look at this, the the rate at which DRAM is increasing is about two times, uh, processor flops is about three times. So you can see these large language models are way outstripping both the processing and the memory. So the memory right now is the bottleneck. So the ability to get more memory bandwidth at HBM4 is really critical to, to have the hardware, this AI training hardware keep up with these large language models. And basically you wanna be able to move data in and out and store it somewhere, right? I mean, this is the whole idea behind what's going on with HBM is you have lots of data, you need to be able to put that somewhere and, and be able to access it as you need it. That's right. So there's different techniques for where you store memory. So you can store the memory locally as close to this, this, the, uh, the SOC as possible. So there are systems that you, that'll have SRAM right within the SOC, but that's given the amount of data, it's gonna be very difficult to get enough memory. So then you have to rely on something like HBM for that additional capacity, then even go off, off chip to say a DIM uh, for additional capacity. One of the ways that you increase that capacity is by going up in more layers, right? Correct, that, that's right. So HBM is, is again, we kind of getting a little ahead of ourselves, is a 3D stacked uh, memory system. Let me just move over here for a second and just show you what I mean. So HBM is, is your traditional DRAM, uh, very, very similar to your traditional DRAM, but it's, it's stacked vertically. So now with HBM4, you can get all the way up to 16 layers of, of DRAM stacked in vertical, and these are connected through three silicon VS, TSVs. And then this has to sit on some kind of uh, interposer technology because as I mentioned, you've got 2,000 signals that I've got to route out of my DRAM, just data lines, plus you have control uh, you've got to route that through the, through the system on a chip. So the way you do that is through some kind of interposer technology. As you push all this data through, do you start generating heat through RC uh, delays and things like that? So heat is a, is a big problem in general for both the, you have SOCs running, you know, 100 watts, you've got the DRAM. So this whole system, heat, heat is always a big concern on, on how to move that out. So the more stacks you have in here, of course, the more power you're, 
you're burning and the, and the more heat you have to deal with. So is there less heat when you're using SRAM because it's generally faster, shorter distance versus HBM? Uh, yeah, of course. It, it, anything you can do on chip is always going to be way more power efficient uh, and way more uh, efficient from a processing standpoint. Absolutely. So how much capacity can you actually get in here? So with the new HBM4 standard, you can go up to 64 gigabytes of capacity. And that's in the case if you have a 16 high stack, and then uh, also the stacks themselves are 32 gigabits each. So if you multiply that out, you'll get 64 gigabytes. And that is the maximum. Is there a logic layer in here now, or is that new? No, the, the logic layer has always been in the HBM stack. Again, back to this picture, the, the, the layer that translates these DRAM, uh, all these different uh, DRAMs uh, die into addresses and, and uh, data movement is through a logic layer. And so that's there. Um, I, I think you're getting at the fact that, hey, I've got a logic layer inside my DRAM. Can I do something with it? And there is t talk in the industry. You may have heard things about custom DRAM. A lot of companies are trying to figure out how I can take advantage of, of having logic inside the DRAM itself. Because the whole idea here is move data as short a distance as possible, right? That's right. So anything you can do in that logic layer that, that minimizes that data movement is, is going to be a big advantage for the, for the system performance, of course. What happens if you stack too high? I mean, can we go much higher than yeah. where we are now? You know, with each layer, there becomes challenges from a reliability standpoint because you've got to run these through silicon vias, and the more, the more layers you have, the more subject they are to, to I guess we talked about heat, vibration, uh, other, other factors. So, yeah, those are, those are challenges that the DRAM uh, vendors are looking at. When we think about HBM, most of that has been associated with 2.5D type of implementations, right, where it's on an interposer. Is that still continuing? I mean, what sort of problems does that bring or what advantages? So I, I think the real uh, magic and the, and the real art of doing an HBM design is in the interposer. The, uh, uh, the signal integrity is really critical in terms of hitting these speeds. As I mentioned, the, the standards at 8 gig, uh, Cadence made an announcement also in April with the standard that has our, our first, our FI, our physical layer, and our controller run up to 12.8 gig. So to run 12.8 gig over these um, thousand, thousand data lines requires quite a bit of skill in terms of, first you have a minimum number of layers you have to deal with to route those signals. So we have to route these signals over, again, depending on the uh, foundry, you have a certain number of layers. You have to, uh, one of the biggest effects we see is crosstalk. So how do you minimize crosstalk when you've got all these signals packed tightly on different layers? So the placement of the signals, the width, of those signals, the, where the ground and power uh, power layers are, those are those are all critical to design. And so Cadence provides actually both know-how from from uh, system engineering and tools that allow you to design this interposer to to, to get the best signal integrity, uh, to get nice clean uh, wide eye openings, and we also provide reference designs to get customers started. There's a lot of redundancy built in here too, right, that, that you didn't have in the past simply because you have so much data, you're using, utilizing these channels a lot more than you would in the past. That's right. So you have to have a ability to do some kind of lane repair. And in each of the channels, you do have extra bits that you can remap that. So the FI and the controller, if, if, uh, if there is a, a bit that's gone bad, then you can remap those. And when we think about fixing that, it's really just rerouting that as opposed to that's right. doing something physical, right? That, that's right. You can't get in. Yeah, you can't physically get inside the interposer. And that, that does bring a lot of uh, challenges as well. So uh, we can look at every signal, uh, all 2048. We can, we can plot eyes for those. We have, we have ways to uh, monitor those signals. And, um, and so, yeah, that's, that's all done through our, our uh, analysis tools. And this has to be done basically throughout the device's lifetime, right? Because Correct. As it comes out of the factory, uh, the fab, it's going to have some problems right there just because of process uh, variation. Yep. As you move forward, it, you basically are sealing up some of those because you're going to have accelerated aging too, right? That, that's right. So there are process monitors built in that, that, that tracks those things. The, the FI, like any other um, DRAM FI, there's, there's training involved, initial training, and then there's also periodic training that you need. So as, as these systems drift, then the, the FI and the controller can can monitor that and then uh, retrain periodically uh, to, to keep that system, uh, the, those eyes, well-centered. Have the number of channels gone up as well as we get into HPM4? Yeah, so one of the things for, uh, as, as we see different types of, 
of large language models are being used for all kinds of things from, from finance to weather. You have different types of data being used. So the, what HBM4 introduced is uh, double the number of channels. So we're now at 32 channels. Each channel has a pseudo channel, so you got 64 channels. So you could manage the granularity of your data based on, again, what you're trying to do. So, so some uh, neural networks prefer you know, 64 uh, by eight, so there's 32. So, the, so that flexibility is built in. That's right. How reliable is this? I mean, when you think about DRAM, it's always been, nobody even thinks about it as you go forward, but HBM is a different story. Yeah, there's, there's been some press right now on the reliability of HBM in the data center. So the, it, it, is, a, it is a factor. And what HBM4 did, it, it, it started to look at adding different types of uh, RAS features into the device. So one of the things is it does do direct refresh. That helps a lot, especially with things like row hammer mitigation. And, and going forward, it's, it's a continued concern to be uh, much to really the reliability, you know, the accessibility, um, the serviceability, right? So you've got to be able to uh, have these things running all the time. That's one thing with the HBM. They don't have a lot of downtime, so they have to be able to run. Uh, they've got to be able to, if, if need be, replace these systems quickly. And that's one of the big changes here too, right, is you, your utilization is significantly higher than it has been in the past. Yeah, absolutely. Again, you, you don't uh, build these very complex 2D systems with all this bandwidth to sit idle. They're being used constantly, and, and they've, got to, they've got to stay uh, online. So what's the lifespan of these versus what it was before because well, the utilization was significantly lower? Yeah, I, I think that hasn't changed. The, the uh, data center uh, has, you know, has requirements around life cycles, and these have to meet them. Uh, you know, Kate and Sui support, you know, uh, the FIs are built from 125 degrees to minus 40 degrees, so we test them. Although the DRAMs don't go that range. So we do try to build in the most reliability we can into the, into the products. And these are being used not just in data centers. It's starting to be used in other places too, right? You think about automotive and aerospace. You're starting to see HBM show up there as well. Yeah, that, that's correct. You have, um, when you think about um, different types of AI systems, whether it be uh, training or on the uh, inference side. So in an automotive, they're very com complex uh, AI inference. So Today, we've seen LPDDR being used. We see uh, GDDR7 being used in cars. And uh, it's a little early for HBM. I think one of the, we get back to this whole reliability. So now you've got to get the, the reliability to the point where it could, it could deal with car environment. And they, and they are being deployed in some cars as well. So we're on a trajectory here, which is very fast data movement, mm -hmm. lots of storage. Where do we go next? Is it going to be HBM 5, 6, 7, or is there something coming in between? Well, again, I can't talk about any JETIC standard, but there's, there's no question that the industry is just going to, keep, going to keep pushing forward for more bandwidth. So I, I, I have no doubt that we're going to see systems that will try to address bandwidth for sure. They're going to definitely try to address the capacity they're going to try to address things like the reliability. So we've talked about that. So I think those are going to, we're going to see continuous improvements on that. Uh, as I mentioned, the, the challenge of building these systems, these two and a half D systems is I think an area where, where Cadence really can differentiate because you got your FI, your controller, and your design. So HBM is not any one of those. You have to have all, all three of those pieces. in. Frank Farrell, thanks for a great explanation. Thank, thanks, Ed.